Hello everybody, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Today I'm continuing the study of the book of Acts, and I'm going to start today with uh, chapter 26, verse 1. Now, I've already covered the first 25 chapters, and those videos are uploaded and available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. So I, I hope you will take the time to watch all the videos from the beginning, uh, because the book of Acts is such an important book of, of the Bible. But right now, let's get started with chapter 26. In the KJV, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews, especially because I know thee to be expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. Wherefore, I beseech thee to hear me patiently. So, uh, just a little bit of context for those of you who have not been you know, watching this whole series. Um, this is probably 25, 26 years after Pentecost. Uh, Pentecost is the beginning of the church. Um, since then, a lot of things have happened. We had the, uh, the killing of, of Stephen about three and a half years after Pentecost. We have the conversion of Paul about six years after Pentecost. We have the, con the conversion of Cornelius and his family, the first Gentile believers who were preached to by the first Gentile preacher, uh, the, the Apostle Peter. Um, and uh, that was about 10 years after Pentecost. Um, th then we have uh, about 20 years after Pentecost, you have Paul's beginning of Paul's missionary journeys and the three missionary journeys, and, and uh, now those are all completed, and you have Paul go to Jerusalem, uh, even though he's warned by a prophet that he'll be arrested. And uh, Paul, knowing that, goes anyway. He goes to Jerusalem, goes to the synagogue. He's confronted by James and the elders of the church in Jerusalem, who are still legalistic. Um, that uh, are st still telling Paul that you, you can't go around teaching people that um, uh, the laws of Moses don't apply anymore. So there's still this disagreement. Uh, and uh, Paul is ordered by James to go do this ritual thing in the temple with two others. And then Paul is confronted by the Jews in the temple because Paul's famous for telling people to no, do not practice Judaism. Uh, circumcision is not required. The dietary laws are not required. The, none of the laws of Moses apply. Uh, and uh, temple worship and animal sacrifices, that's all in the past. Uh, you need to um, reject all of that and instead put your faith entirely in Jesus. Believe that Jesus is the one and only way to heaven, and you saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Your faith cannot be divided between Jesus and uh, Judaism, or any, any religion, or any religious practices, any religious works. So, Paul, uh, there's a riot that breaks out at the temple. They want to tear Paul limb from limb. The Roman authorities come in to they rescue Paul. They take him out and when Paul tells them he's a Roman citizen and he, he ends up uh, being taken to uh, uh, see the, the Roman governor and then while he's at the Roman governor's, uh, you know, the, the Jewish authorities are told that they can come and present their arguments against Paul. The, the king says there's no 
reason to ex to kill Paul. He's not guilty of anything worthy of uh, death. Uh, but uh, but now Paul is uh, uh, in front of the King Agrippa, and, and he uh, the Jewish authorities present their case, and now Paul is given a chance to uh, present his defense. So he. He tells King Agrippa that, oh, look, I know you're very uh, knowledgeable about the customs and the, and the practices of, of Judaism. So I'm, he's saying, I'm happy that you're, you're qualified to, to hear this, uh, this case. Uh, let me read those first few verses in the Amplified. Uh, I know some of you, many of you probably are KJV only. I was KJV only for 25 years. Uh, right now I would classified myself as a KJV firstist. Uh, I always want to read the KJV first, and it's the one I rely on for the truth, but I'm not KJV only in that I, I do think that there is something to be gained at looking at other translations. There's something to be gained by um, uh, reading Bible commentaries. Uh, there's something to be gained by even getting the comments of other believers in, 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 uh, in discussions and debates. And I, in any way I can get enough more information to consider, uh, I, I want to take advantage of that. So the translation that I'd like to look at in addition to the, the KJV is the Amplified, because the Amplified is, uh, the way I describe it is, it's a combination of a translation and a commentary blended together. It amplifies, and it's also written in easy to understand English. So after reading the KJV, sometimes I like to see what the how the Amplified phrases it. So let's look at that now. Um, the, the Amplified also has titles and subtitles for chapters. So this the title for this chapter in the Amplified is Paul's Defense Before Agrippa. Twenty six. Verse 1, Then Agrippa said to Paul, You are now permitted to speak on your own behalf. At that, Paul stretched out his hand as an orator and made his defense as follows. I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa, since it is before you that I am to make my defense today regarding all the charges brought against me by the Jews, especially because you are an expert, fully knowledgeable, experienced, and unusually conversant in all the Jewish customs and controversial issues. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. All right, easy to understand, but uh, not uh, no, nothing really um, more to get out of that than, than the KJV. Let's look at now, back to the KJV, verse 4. My manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among my own nation at Jerusalem, Known all, know all the Jews, which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify, that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. So he's, he's uh, explaining his, uh, the, the, the history of his life, that uh, he grew up and was raised and taught very strictly by the, the most straightest sect of our religion, uh, the Pharisees. Verse 6, And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, unto which promise are twelve tribes, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come, for which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you, that God should raise the dead. So, uh, Paul used the uh, the subject, and the question of the resurrection, not not referring now to the resurrection of Jesus, but uh, the resurrection of all mankind that is promised, that I think is uh, shortly to come. But uh, Paul uses this subject to cause a division in Jerusalem between the Sadducees and the Pharisees because the Pharisees believe in the resurrection and uh, they're, 
Sadducees do not believe that there is a future bodily resurrection of all mankind. So because of this division, Paul was able to cause them to fight among themselves instead of you know, being focusing on him. Uh, he used that as a tactic, uh, but, but now he's, he's also relating that to the fact that, uh, look, um, the resurrection is promised by the prophets but it's, uh, we've, all, we've already seen it, the first fruits of it, in that uh, Jesus, our promised Savior, our Messiah, Christ, uh, uh, he, he has come and he was killed, uh, died for our sins, but he was raised from the dead. So it's this resurrection that he's going to uh, emphasize because it's the death, burial, and resurrection that is the heart of the salvation message that uh, we, we believe that uh, Jesus is the promised Messiah, but he was rejected, and he, but he, he, he God knows the future. God knew that uh, he would be rejected, but he came anyway because his purpose was not to be accepted and become a political ruler, a king over Israel. His real purpose was to die. Jesus said, uh, uh, I came to give my life as a ransom. So the purpose of him becoming a man and, and coming down from heaven uh, as a man was in order to die. God cannot die. He had to take on flesh become a man in order to die. He had to die to pay for your sins and mine, to pay for the sins of all humanity, everyone who's ever lived. Uh, but then he was raised from the dead, showing us that he has power over life and death, that he has the victory. And uh, this, he raised himself from the dead as a uh, proof that he will also raise us from the dead. Uh, so that's why he's, he's really emphasizing and going to the resurrection as the main part of his uh, argument here. Um, verse 8, why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, uh, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison. So now he's going to his, uh, he's talked about his youth being raised as a Pharisee, and then now he's going to give an account of his, the period of time when he was the persecutor of the church. Uh, before he was the Apostle Paul, he was Saul of Tarsus and a Pharisee that, that was charged, that was given the responsibility of rounding up the first Christian believers and, and, and uh, to uh, imprison them and kill them. Uh, verse 10, which thing I also did in Jerusalem and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having, having received authority from uh, the chief priests and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them uh, and I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. Um, the blaspheme was to uh, denounce their belief in Jesus. That, uh, it's blasphemy to say that, oh, Jesus is not the promised one. He's not the Christ, the Son of God. He's not the Savior. That would be blasphemy. So he's trying to force them to, to recant and renounce their faith in Jesus. Um, um, I compelled them to blaspheme and being exceedingly mad against them that's uh, angry uh, hating them I persecuted them unto even unto strange cities so he went all over the, uh, that uh, area of the world uh, all these various cities to persecute them uh, verse 12 Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun, 
shining round about me and them which journey with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, so this light was powerful and it made them fall off of the horses and onto their knees, onto the ground, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Uh, that just means that uh, uh, the, the pricks would be uh, the, the thorns in a, in a, in a bush and, and uh, to resist against them, to go against the grain, to, uh, to resist the truth. That, that uh, uh, hey, this prophet's promised a Messiah, a Savior. He would come. Now, Jesus is that fulfilled Messiah, but you're resisting it. You're not accepting it. You're kicking against the pricks. Um, so this is what Jesus said to him. And verse 15, And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. So Jesus was not there during Paul's persecution. He was not physically holding on to Jesus. He did not personally uh, uh, beat Jesus, imprison Jesus, and kill Jesus. So why does Jesus say, uh, uh, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest? Because uh, Paul was persecuting all of those who put their faith in Jesus because the scriptures tell us that when we believe in Jesus, uh, we are in Christ and Christ is in us. So when you persecute, when Paul was persecuting the believers, he was persecuting Jesus too in that respect. Uh, that's through verse 15. Let me read the Amplified through that portion there. So then all the Jews know my manner of life from my youth up, which from the beginning was spent among my own nation, the Jewish people, and in Jerusalem. They have known me for a long time, if they are willing to testify to it, that according to their strictest sect of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee, and now I am standing trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers, which hope of the Messiah and the resurrection our twelve tribes confidently expect to realize as they serve and worship God in earnest night and day. And, and for this hope, O King, I am being accused by Jews. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead. Now, do you think it's interesting why he always call he refers to uh, I'm being accused by Jews? I mean, Paul, Paul is a Jew. Jesus uh, was a Jew, and so why would he act like and phrase it in a way that they're the Jews, but I'm not a Jew? Um, because he he is still a, a Jew by birth, and he has this lifelong history as a Jew, the strictest sect of Jews, the Pharisees, and yet he seems to speak in a way that they're they're different than him. They're not because he's no longer part of that. He has left Judaism. His his faith is entirely on Jesus now. He does not practice Judaism. He does not. Uh, require others. In, ta in, fa in fact, he forbids others. He says uh, in the book of Galatians, if you must, uh, if we're saved by grace, uh, not by not by our works. And if you if you think that any religious work is required, circumcision, dietary laws, water baptism, anything. If you think any religious work is required for salvation, then uh, Grace is no more grace. It's got to be completely grace and faith, or it's got to be completely religious works to justify your salvation. Uh, it can't be a combination. Do you, 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 if you believe that works are required, you've nullified the grace of God. You've canceled it. You've made it of no effect. This is Paul's argument in his ministry, and, that, and that's, that's the faith that we must have today for salvation. Uh, so, he. Uh, I think it's interesting how he says, O King, I am being accused by Jews. 
Uh, so that's why he's, uh, he's he's speaking in a way that the Jews are a different. They're 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 a different faction apart f from him. Even though, as I said, he was raised as a Jew, he was the most ardent Jew. But now he doesn't see himself as a Jew in that respect. Even though he has a lifelong history of being born and raised and uh, taught in. Uh, as, a, as a strict Jew. Uh, why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? So, I mean, he's saying that you're, as Jews, you shouldn't be surprised. You shouldn't think it's amazing or impossible or, or weird in any way that God would raise the dead. Of course, unless you're one of the Jews that is a, a Sadducee that said, Said, you see, is uh, the name, and we like to say that they're, uh, they don't believe in the resurrection. Uh, they're sad, you see, there is no resurrection. Sad, you see, not believing in the resurrection. But those of us who do believe in the resurrection are not sad. We're joyful because we know we will be raised back to life, everlasting life, with glorified uh, in immortal bodies that will never have to uh, be sick or uh, suffer or there will be no death or sorrow or crying or pain in the future uh, in, a, in the new heavens and the new earth. That's our promise. That's what's waiting us as believers in Jesus. Um, verse 9, So then I once thought to myself that it was my duty to do many things in opposition to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Um, and this is just what I did in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints, that's God's people, in prison and receiving authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being condemned to death, I cast my vote against them. And I often punished them, making them suffer in all the synagogues and tried to force them to blaspheme. And in my extreme rage at them, I kept hunting them even to foreign cities, harassing and persecuting them. While so engaged, I was traveling to Damascus with the authority and commission and full power of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven surpassing the brightness of the sun, shining all around me and those who were traveling with me. And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice in the Hebrew dialect, that's Jewish Aramaic, saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick repeatedly against the goads, offering pointless resistance. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Get up and stand on your feet. Uh, let me see, I'll go back to the KJV for verse 16. Um, uh, this is, I don't know how many times Paul has uh, given this testimony of his, uh, this encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. I'm thinking that this, this has been repeated now throughout the book of Acts. I'm guessing at least three or four or five times now. Um, and each account is not necessarily identical word for word. Uh, not, not that there's contradictions, it's, it, it's just that when you explain something, you don't necessarily explain it exactly the same way every time because uh, uh, it's not a memorized script that he's reading. Verse 16, the KJV. But rise and stand upon thy feet. This is Jesus still speaking to Saul. Um, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee. So not only is Jesus saying, Saul, you're going to be a witness of this encounter with me now, but in the future, I will continue to appear to you and, and uh, teach you. So 
That's why Paul said that over the years, uh, everything he had learned and what he was teaching was not learned uh, from other uh, believers like any of the apostles. He, he got his teaching directly from this resurrected Jesus who appeared to him repeatedly over the years to instruct him. Verse 17, Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. So he's sending Saul to become the Apostle Paul whose mission will be to tell the good news that salvation is a free gift offered to everyone and I want you to go to the whole world, the Gentile world. Don't limit yourself only to the Jewish people even though every time Paul, over the many years, over decades now, Paul is preaching from city to city and he says it's his custom to always go to the synagogue first to never give up on the Jewish brethren. Um, uh, then he, he never lost his love for his fellow Jews. He never uh, failed in telling them the good news about Jesus. But then uh, most of them rejected it, and many of them sought to kill him. In fact, they did stone him and leave him for dead at one point. Uh, but uh, he had great success with Gentiles. Uh, telling them the good news. Um, verse 18, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. See, they're sanctified by faith in Jesus, not by becoming a, a Jew and practicing Judaism, following the laws of Moses. And even today, most Christians think that the Ten Commandments apply to the church. The Ten Commandments are ten of, three, of 613 laws that are written down by Moses uh, and received from God that applied to Israel and the Jewish people. They were never, the laws of Moses were never given to the Gentile world the scripture tells us the law that applied to the Gentiles was the law of conscience. God wrote right and wrong in the conscience of all men. And so to think that the laws of Moses, 613 or even the 10 that are written on stone, ever applied to, to, to Gentiles, and to think that they applied to Gentiles even today is a um, very serious um, error. And um, so he's... He's, it's, Jesus is saying here, you're sanctified by faith in me. Jesus says you're sanctified by faith in Jesus. Uh, not by being religious, not by repenting of your sins, not by uh, changing your life and making your accept, self acceptable to God, because that's impossible. To be acceptable by God on our own merit, we would have to go before God sinless. And, and no one could in a lifetime could ever go to God and say, look, my entire life I've been perfect. I've, I've never done one bad thing wrong. I've never e even had one bad thought. I've, I've never even failed to do good at every opportunity. If you think that you, if you died now, you could argue that ca your case in that way to God, then you're deluded. Um, scriptures tell us that's the reason Jesus came because man was in a hopeless, helpless, futile situation. And no one could go before God and say, I'm good, or in, in good in God's sense is, is perfect. Good in man's sense is relative. Like, if you think you're a good person, well, you might be good in a relative sense in that, well, you're better than a lot of people. Uh, there are a lot of people that are much worse than you, so you have relative goodness. But the kind of goodness that's required for salvation is perfect goodness, perfection. And, and none of us are able to do that. Only Jesus was able to live a, live a perfect, sinless life. And the only way that we are seen as perfect, sinless in God's sight, is by having the righteousness, the perfection of Jesus uh, clothed in that. We wear the white robes of righteousness, uh, and God sees us as sinlessly perfect when we put our faith in Jesus. It's imputed righteousness the righteousness of Jesus that, that we have as believers. So, 
So here in verse 18, Jesus says, you're sanctified by faith in him. Uh, verse 19, whereupon, O King Agrippa, now this is Paul speaking again. Um, previously, that was Paul giving his account of Jesus' words to him many years earlier. Um, and um, verse 19, whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God. In this case, repent does not mean uh, change your, uh, your life, uh, get sin out of your life, even change your attitude about sin and, and feel remorse and sadness and contrition over sin. No, repent it means, the word is metanoia in Greek, and it means to change your mind. Uh, so let me read it now with that, uh, those words. It says that they should change their mind and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. So uh, um, change your mind. If you don't believe in Jesus for your salvation, if you don't believe that uh, salvation comes only through Jesus and that you're saved because of faith alone in Christ alone, then you need to change your mind about that. You get a new way of thinking, a new belief, and believe on Jesus entirely, and then you're, then you're qualified that you, and now any good work that you do actually has some value and some meaning in that not that it, they contribute towards your salvation, but when you die and you're judged by God, he will give you credit for your good works and you will get uh, what the scriptures tell us are, are the re rewards of, uh, the scriptures calls it, uh, uh, we will receive uh, gold, silver, and precious gems. But this is these are symbolic of some kind of rewards that believers get uh, in eternity because of the ministry works we did after we put our faith in Jesus. But these works should never be uh, construed as uh, working for our salvation. It's we're, we're, we're saved because of our faith in Jesus and our, we're, our works are to because we love to tell people about Jesus. We, we love to serve Jesus. Uh, not everybody does, sadly. Uh, and once we put our faith in Jesus, um, the, the type of spiritual maturity that uh, is, is developed over our lifetime varies greatly from one believer to the next. We're not, um, we're not um, identical. Uh, we're, we're still unique individuals. As, as a, when you're born in the world, you're unique. Your success in life uh, will vary from person to person, and our success as a Christian in terms of serving God varies greatly uh, because we're unique. Some of us uh, listen to the Holy Spirit into, in, in, that's uh, inside us, trying to direct our lives, and some of us resist it. We all listen and resist to varying degrees. And so that's why a person's success in growth, spiritual growth and maturity, and in uh, good works, uh, it, it varies so much because we're unique and we don't all conform to the desires, the, the promptings of the Holy Spirit in, in, in the same way. That's why we should not be hard on each other, judging each other's lives, uh, because we're saved because of our faith in Jesus, and then many of us succeed greatly and many of us will fail greatly in terms of living out a Christian life as uh, that everybody can say, look, boy, they've really changed a lot. Look at their lives. Uh, but some people, it's not so easy to find a great change in their life, but we should not diminish their uh, or, or challenge their salvation uh, on that basis. Um, to determine and judge someone's salvation, we simply ask them, do you believe you're going to go to heaven, and if so, why? If you were in front of God now, and he said, why should I let you into heaven? How, what, how would you plead your case before God? If someone is, says, well, I would argue to God that I'm a good person, and I deserve heaven because I, I did a, uh, you know, I, I changed my life, I went to church, I did all kinds of good things, and I deserve heaven, then in that case, you're... Um, the Bible says all your good works are like filthy rags in the sight of God. They, they, they have no value in terms of earning salvation. 
But if you said, well, I believe I am going to go to heaven. I'm confident in it. Be not because of anything good I've done, but because of what Jesus has done for me. Uh, Jesus died for my sins. Jesus promised me eternal life if I would trust him. And so uh, if God asked me why he should let me into heaven, I would argue that it's only because of Jesus. Nothing, nothing be, uh, based on anything I've ever done, all, only, only based upon what Jesus has done for me and, and his promise to me. Uh, so that's why we need to understand this, uh, the, 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 these distinctions when we talk about faith for salvation, we talk about repentance, we talk about good works, it must be all thought of in that way. Verse 21, For these causes the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continued unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer, and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead, and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. So he's saying that all of these things are prophesied by the prophets in the Old Testament. And as, as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth made thee mad. And that mad is not uh, anger, but it's, it's insane. So he's saying, you, you, are you insane? Paul, you've learned so much that you've gone insane. Um, verse 25, but he said, Paul says, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely, for I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. So he's saying to King Agrippa, you're very much aware of everything I'm telling you. This is history. Everybody is aware of all these things that have happened over the last 25 years since Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. For 25 years now, I'm giving you, a, uh, telling you what everybody is very much aware of. None of these things are secret. Um, verse 27, King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Oh, so sad. So sad. So close. Agrippa was this close to being saved. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And so, see, Paul, uh, he, he, he made his best effort with every person. Every Jew, all the Jews in the synagogues, all the Gentiles around the uh, that part of the world, everybody he could talk to, and even kings, he gave his best effort to persuade them to believe in Jesus. Verse 29, And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. In other words, I wish you were not just almost a believer, but entirely, completely. Uh, he says, we're both almost and all together. All together means God is completely, completely believing in Jesus. Uh, you're, I wish you were just like me. Your faith was just as, just like mine, just as strong as mine, just as convinced as I am, except I don't desire that you're like me in, in bonds. Verse 30, and when he had thus spoken, the king rose up, and the governor, and Bernice, and they sat with them. And when they were gone aside, they talked between themselves, saying, This man doeth nothing worthy of death or of bonds. Then said Agrippa unto Festus, This man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. So, because he appealed unto Caesar, now they have no choice. They're legally bound to send him to Rome. But if he hadn't appealed to Caesar, they could have just made the decision right there and settled the matter, set him free. He's, he's not guilty of anything. He's, these Jews are making accusations against him that are, have no merit 
regarding Roman law that would justify him being put to death. All right, so that's the end of this chapter. That's chapter 26, only two chapters left. This is so exciting to me. I, I, hope, I hope you are enjoying this and as excited about this as I am, that uh, the history of the church. All right, well, again, let me urge you, if you've come across this single video and you haven't seen all the entire series, I hope you will take the time, invest the time to watch this series from the beginning, the entire study on the Book of Acts. Uh, it's a playlist titled uh, Book of Acts, a verse-by-verse -verse commentary. It's on my, available on my YouTube channel, so please watch it from the beginning. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.